Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. And this Hindu trinity is one of the greatest enduring iconographies in world religion. Common narratives concerning its symbology today will speak about how it represents the cosmic functions of creation, maintenance and destruction. And this is nothing new. Gods and demons have been known to be nothing more than representational images for the divine unknown. Their idols and temples were grand totems to be used during our prayers and meditation. This has been the discourse adopted by many rationalists since the dawn of Western Enlightenment. That was until Austrian psychologist Carl Jung came along and changed the way we looked at religious symbology. When we internalized Jung's findings, we found a darker psychological narrative at play behind the iconography of the Hindu Trimurti. Carl Jung and his predecessor Sigmund Freud are widely credited with changing the fields of analytical psychology and psychotherapy. While Sigmund Freud captured the imagination of public with his radical theses, Carl Jung's influence was a bit more subtle. This is mainly because Carl Jung's ideas are hard to understand. Now Jung did some profound work in the understanding of religion and how psychology interacts with its culture. This connection made by Carl Jung broke new ground in psychoanalytics and culture studies and some experts call this new field of study as psychotheology. In his essay, Aspects of Libido, Carl Jung explains how individuals perceive the psychotheological dimension of their being. Not many people understand or appreciate the magnitude of what Carl Jung was trying to hint here. Carl Jung believed that religious and cultural myths and legends had solid psychological basis to them. Gods and goddesses, Rakshas, all of them are basically products of mind. They are psychological entities that help the individual cope with the dominant reality of the world. Mythic lore is what captures the imagination of all citizens of the larger culture. As their minds gain a unifying common orientation, the entire culture now acts as a grand singular mind. This is how our cultures help us reconcile our psychotheological morality. This is how different cultures find meaning and purpose behind their beliefs and value orientation. The civilizational culture then champions the use of grand motifs and grand narratives like the Hindu Trimurti to remind the individuals about their place in the world. And most importantly, their place in their own minds. Jung was heavily influenced by Vedantic philosophies of the Upanishads. This probably influenced him in his thesis, in which he declares that the ultimate psychological aim of the individual is to complete oneself. This process is called individuation. In the words of Carl Jung himself, individuation means becoming single homogeneous being. It also implies becoming one's own self. We could therefore translate individuation as self-realization. But this self-realization comes at a cost. One has to understand oneself, and that's painful. The process helps us derive meaning in life. This helps us cope with suffering. Our persona is merely a projection to the real world of what mind contains. And the mind contains the following. Ego. This is the conscious aspect of the mind. Shadow. This is the unconscious aspect of the mind which is repressed. Oftentimes, this involves a darker side which the ego is afraid of and the persona is ashamed of. The shadow need not always be negative though. It can be positive, but ego might still repress it out of fear or inertia. Anima This is the collective unconscious aspect of mind as it coexists with the other minds in a culture. These generally store repressed memories of a culture or grand symbols which are manifested in each individual's mind. This lends meaning and purpose to individual's life and more importantly, it comforts it by reinforcing a sense of belonging. This gives it identity. The manifestation of these symbols and motifs, their intensity and their effects on each individual's life depend on the individual's capacity of psychic energy. But what do these different layers of mind have to do with Trimurti? How does this affect each and every believer in shaping their psychotheological being? We believe that the mythic legend behind the Hindu Trimurti is a psychic projection of the Hindu dharmic mind. It is a culmination of the dharmic mind's process of individuation in which all these adherents must aspire towards a unified culture. The essence is Vedantic. 
Just look at the imagery behind the Hindu trinity. You will see a projection of how each god stands for three aspects of the mind as explained by Carl Jung. The ego, the anima and the shadow. Vishnu is the caretaker god. He can be associated with the ego as the conscious aspect of mind. If you pay close attention to some of the myths and legends of Vishnu, you will find that he is a householder god. He is a god of this world who is responsible for its preservation. Just like the ego represents consciousness and roots the mind to its place in the dominant culture and the larger world, Brahma is the creator god. He can be associated with the anima as the collective unconscious aspect of mind. If you pay close attention to some of the myths and legends of Brahma, you will find that he is not worshipped by anyone. He is unattainable just like how a mind can never fully engage with the entirety of collective unconsciousness. It will always be a subset of its culture. The creator god represents knowledge just like how a mind retains learning from information it receives from a dominant culture. And Shiva? Shiva is the destroyer god. He can be associated with the shadow as the unconscious aspect of the mind. Considered as the manifestation of the Rig Vedic deity, Rudra, Shiva is a god who is feared as much as he is venerated. The narratives revolving around his myths are diverse. Shiva has always had this mystical quality about him. Although Shiva has been shown in the householder or the Grahaspati avatar, he is commonly associated with the depictions in which he is terrible, fierce and full of rage. His Tandva is literally the dance of death. If you pay close attention to some of the myths and legends of Shiva, you will find that the reason he is worshipped by a majority of Hindus could be because of a culture's inherent fear of annihilation. This is where it gets interesting. Shiva's shadow aspect of the mind is a contentious topic. The shadow self is generally considered a taboo side of the individual's persona. It is never projected. That's because the ego represses this darker side from a world so that the persona may gain wider acceptance in the social hierarchies and dominant cultures. We as individuals are never at ease with our darker, repressed selves. We are not comfortable with our own capacity for nether passions like violence and other vices. But this is not healthy according to Carl Jung. The process of individuation demands that ego expands and integrates the shadow itself. We must be capable of mayhem. We must know the scope of evil contained in our shadow selves. We must know how to wield our swords, but we must keep it sheathed and visible at all times. So embrace your darker side and try to internalize Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva in you, in all totality. Who knows, you might actually find yourself. This is India. Thanks for watching.